We are live. Well, hey, everyone. It's time for Geocache Talk. Whether you're at work, in the car, or wherever you are, we hope you enjoy the show. Please give it a like and subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play so that you can get all the weekly Geocache Talk goodness. Big thanks to the Travel Bugs for the music and my patrons, Doug Jones, Joshua and Caleb Slinkard, Tom Brotherman, Jeff Arbaugh, Deborah Burris, Joshua Johnson, Nick Hubbard, Andrew Teepkin, Cecilia Perez, Sydney Sawyer, Valena Mahar, Jane Jewell, Dana Pugach, Memphis Mafia, Craig Michelle, and the Geo Gearheads. If you'd like to become a patron, head on over to patreon.com slash geocache talk for more details. Patrons get path tags, coins, and other geocaching swag during the year as well as invites to special events only for patrons. Support levels start at as little as $3 a month. So we're going to jump right in. we got a big show tonight. So we're going to jump right into show number 28 for Sunday, December 18th. As I welcome my friend, Doug McCray, to the show. Welcome to Geocache Talk. Thank you. <laughs> it's so How glad you, you could. You bet. I'm glad you could make it. Uh, Doug and I... Um, we we did uh, we did got to do a show back on the, the cache release days and uh, when I started geocache talk, uh, Doug was the first first person I uh, I, I uh, sent a note to, and um, we kind of had to work things out. Doug Doug likes to travel, <laughs> right, Doug? I do very much, <laughs> very much. And uh, so anyway, it uh, it actually worked out great uh, timing wise for right here around Christmas. So. Um, it uh, was uh, was neat. I was just uh, glad to have you back on and talk talk some some great stories, Doug. You've got some great stories to tell. Where do you like to start? <laughs> We're gonna start with your days at MIT and the the lead up to um, Ms. Pac Man, which is a fascinating story. Um, and I think uh, you know. It's like a, uh, it's like a soap opera of, s of sorts, I think. <laughs> um, so I guess start with um, with how you kind of even got involved with um, a, a arcade and and kind of how that all sort of began. Sure. Well, uh, while I was at MIT, I bought my first pinball machine. Yay. It was a pioneer pinball machine, uh, the old mechanical ones that had tons of wires, solenoids, and everything else, and had to be fixed almost every night. Uh, but I put it in my dorm, and it started receiving lots and lots of quarters. <laughs> and I looked at it and said, this could be quite the business. So I bought a second pinball machine, a third pinball machine, and took on a partner to help empty out the quarters and to help fix them. And the business kept growing. We ended up... Uh, uh, by our junior year of uh, school, of having about 20 machines on campus, both awesome. pinball machines and uh, video games, because they were just starting up. And we had our own route going and ended up pretty much paying our tuition with quarters. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, I know you've, you've, you've told me before, but it's, this is a, a neat thing uh, for everyone tonight and listening uh, on on the show is, I never knew this until I heard from you that how much quarters weigh. <laughs> because well, go ahead, it actually became quite a problem that uh, in order to uh, cash quarters in, uh, the nearest bank was about a mile away. So we would load up a backpack, and um, just as you were saying, a thousand dollars of quarters weighs fifty pounds. Uh, so we would load Amazing. up a backpack. Uh, one broke once on the uh, local subway. Uh, <laughs> it just thud. It did not open up and roll quarters everywhere. But right. uh, we were carting a lot of quarters around. And one of our schemes for carting less quarters around, since we did not have a dollar bill changer, mm -hmm. was that if anybody ever saw us, we would give five quarters for a dollar. It meant we had to cart less quarters around. And we always knew we'd get all the quarters back again. <laughs> Right. It was, it was genius because people are like, this is awesome. I can go play five games now instead of four. You're just getting all the quarters back. 
In fact, we once tested that and put uh, dots of red paint on uh, a couple hundred quarters and almost every single one made it back in our hands. It worked out perfect. It did. Well, um, from, from those days of, um, like you said, being able to, to work out, uh, you know, tuition through the, the arcade. Um, so where did that lead you to? Well, by our senior year, we had this business going, uh, which had roughly 20 games on campus, three of which were the game Missile Command. Uh, which I love. I love Missile it, Command. I was never a game how, for yeah. MIT students. Uh, you get to <laughs> defend cities from these uh, nuclear missiles coming in uh, that are trying to blow up each city uh, and, and intercept them. I only got so good at it. Some people are really good at when you first get the screen, you got to like put a lot of bombs out at a certain thing because it got faster and faster and faster. So, but I, I thought it was a neat game. I really did. I loved it. So, so we, we own three of these and they cost about uh, $2,500 a piece. And in the first uh, week of owning them, they each brought in $700. Wow. And we go, wow, we'll pay them back in three and a half weeks. Right. The next, the next week brought in 500. Uh, primarily because people were playing for longer and they were starting to get bored. So they were, the, the machines were not being used as much. The third week, it dropped down to about $350. And we said, well, we've got you know, a little bit of a problem here. We're going to get our money back. But boy, those days we were getting $700, $700 a week were amazing. So yeah. we started kicking around the idea of how do you make the game harder, uh, progressively harder, and more interesting? Mm -hmm. And so rather than head down to Fort Lauderdale or wherever the hip place was uh, for spring break, uh, we stuck around and decided to try engineering what was an enhancement kit to the game. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to sell enhancement kits that could be plugged into the game and make the game more interesting and harder. And so we came up with a, uh, a sequel, in effect, to mi uh, Missile Command called uh, Super Missile Attack. And we sold these out of the back of the trade journals uh, that were existing at the time uh, for $295 a piece, which is a bargain when you would look and say uh, how much it increased the revenue, even in its first week. Right. Uh, and it cost us about $30 to make, assembling them in the basement and shipping them out of the living room, et cetera. And so we started this enterprise and rather than working on our thesis as we we're supposed to do our uh, <laughs> senior year right uh, we worked on selling these and sold a little over a thousand of them uh, wow. at uh, 295 dollars a piece so we netted about a quarter million dollars and said wow this is exciting business <laughs> that's good now and now these are um these are boards but you know for some that are some of our younger folk who have never really maybe opened up a, uh, we used to own a pinball machine. It was really cool to open it up and take a look inside. But these games had um, basically kind of like a, the inside of a computer. It had a board. And y'all were in basically, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Doug, but y'all were uh, basically making a, it was like a daughter board that you would plug, you could plug on into the, into the, 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 um, uh, onto the motherboard or it was near, near the motherboard somehow. Okay. Correct. What, what we, what we were doing is adding a daughter card on or daughter, daughter board right. and overlaying the code on top of the original Atari code. Okay. Uh, we were concerned about uh, copyright infringement, so we couldn't just copy their code and modify it. Uh, so we had sophisticated hardware that would overlay our code on top of theirs, so we were not copying their code. Right. Which not that it survived the right. uh, challenges later. Right. Well, I was going to say, which became very important <laughs> over the, uh, as time went on. So, um, so anyway, go ahead. Continue the story. I'm sorry. So uh, we started on our second enhancement kit, and it was to uh, the most popular game at the time, which was Pac-Man, mm -hmm. uh, which was great for an enhancement kit for three reasons. One, it was extremely popular game. They had uh, just crossed 100,000 or were on their way to crossing 100,000 cabinets uh, mm -hmm. out there in the marketplace. Second is that the game was extremely boring after a while because you could just memorize the patterns 
uh, mm -hmm. that the monsters went through. And three, you could play it almost forever because you could memorize the patterns and there was only one maze. So right. we looked at it and said, well, let's add more mazes, add some new features, and most importantly, add intelligence to the monsters such that you can't play it forever. Ah, so we came out, came out with this enhancement kit and we're getting ready to market it. And then we got uh, <laughs> sued by Atari over the original Missile Command enhancement kit. Oh, wow. And ended up in US District Court fighting on uh, issues of intellectual property which was very, very new in the market at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, copyright applied to books and not much sure. else. Right. And it wasn't clear what it covered and what it did not. We had not actually copied the actual code, so right. we thought we were fine. Sure. Atari sued on everything they could think of, uh, misrepresentation of origin, trademark dilution, copyright infringement, and took us uh, to court. We ended up in U.S. District Court in Boston, mm -hmm. uh, which is a federal court, um, and started battling it out. And in the end, it's not clear who would have won, but Atari came to us and said, what is it you guys want? <laughs> How about that? And we just told them we wanted to develop video games. Right. So they gave us a contract to develop video games. That is awesome. And um, it, in uh, hindsight, we find out that the contract was just to pay us off to go away, uh, either to go back to school and get our degrees, as maybe we should have, <laughs> or uh, to maybe go sit on the beach and right. uh, spend all the money they gave us on the contract. The contract had no requirements for us to actually do anything. Right. But we looked at it as an opportunity we became the biggest recruiters on the MIT campus of students, passing IBM and Hewlett Packard at the time, and hired engineers to start designing video games for Atari. And a couple months later, we submitted our first and then our second and our third video game to Atari. And over the next year and a half to two years, we contributed 76 video games to Atari and became their largest design house. Which is amazing. Name some of the, the games because for everyone who, young or old, the, some of these games are, you know, are we grew up with these games. It's really uh, a neat list. So tell, tell us a little bit about these. You know, they, they were primarily the home versions of many of the games that you may know from the arcades or may know from playing at home. Uh, Asteroids, uh, Battle Zones, Centipede, Millipede. Dig Dug, Food Fight, Galaga, Galaxions, Joust, Junior Pac-Man, uh, Pole Position, Robotron, mm -hmm. um, any of the popular games at the time, we were uh, trying to do the home versions as uh, authentically as we could and get them to market very, very quickly for Atari. Wow, it's amazing. You know, those are, you know, uh, and, and I, I, what's funny is that some, some of these games and, um, We've talked before about like food fight, but um, some of these games are they they may look on the surface like a game, and you guys probably experienced this too. And just that is this game like going to catch on or not? And you're like not sure if it's going to catch on, but it, it they did, and so um, you know it, it was neat to to hear those names because so many of those games even today, you know, people love to play. You know some of these games even though we've got all the the new video game you know technology and everything uh you still people playing you know galaga on their phones and stuff so it's kind of neat to 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 see that well we we knew that most of them were going to be successful because the arcade game was already successful sure so it was already done by another company and we were uh the house that was responsible for uh porting them or engineering them onto the home sure. systems and right. figuring out how to make them run best. Right. So during this whole process, yeah. uh, if you remember, we had this second enhancement kit going on, right. uh, which was the enhancement kit to Pac-Man. Right. And the agreement with Atari that we reached said that we would never uh, market a enhancement kit ever again because mm -hmm. we threatened their livelihood <laughs> right. by uh, ruining their uh, uh, 
obsolesc obsolescence wow. of their uh, mm -hmm. games out there. Right. And so we agreed we would never sell an enhancement kit again without the manufacturer's permission. Mm -hmm. Atari right. the manufacturer would never give us permission. Right. So what did we do? We flew out to uh, Chicago and met with Valley Midway, who, was, uh, who had the rights to Pac-Man for North America. Sure. And said to them that we would like their permission for us to make the enhancement kit. Uh, we showed them that we had just uh, beaten Atari in court because Atari dropped the lawsuit yep. and that uh, they might as well just give us permission. It just so had it that we showed up very shortly after they were giving out pink slips uh, for the production workers that were producing the Pac-Man cabinets. Oh, and it wow. had to run its course, and they had no follow-on whatsoever. Sure. And so uh, the president of Valley Midway's eyes lit up and said, <laughs> sequel. Right. And so uh, in a very quick period of time, we started making a few modifications changed the game from uh, the enhancement kit's name, which was Crazy Auto. Crazy Auto with the legs. It had legs on it. With so. legs and everything. <laughs> uh, gave it a bow, gave it a birthmark, and made it a female character matching uh, the third animation uh, where uh, uh, Ms. Pac-Man and Pac-Man get introduced to each other, they chase, and then eventually have a baby. Right. Uh, and so we had these animations in there. It gave us the idea that it should be a female Pac-Man. Right. And it became... Uh, Pac Woman, and then someone said, Pac Woman is not a good name. Why don't we call Miss Pac Man? Miss Pac Man, right? And came very close into going into production as Miss Pac Man until someone reminded us that in the third animation, they have a baby together, and right. Miss would be very inappropriate. Right. So the game got changed to Misses, and then at the very last moment, got changed to Miz. Right. And uh, so it had four or five different names within the last week of design oh, wow. before it went into production and shipped finally as Ms. Backman, which Ms. became Backman. the biggest selling video game in North America of all time. Yes. And 1982 was the original? Correct. Okay. Uh, we, we first approached Valley Midway in 91. We, the game was finished then, but it got put in production probably around February. Okay. And uh, you, had, you put a note in the show notes I thought was fascinating about uh, how many quarters were minted in 1982. So tell that real quick. That's great. Yeah. We, we had heard the story uh, initially that when video games got started in Japan uh, mm -hmm. um, and when Pac-Man became big in Japan, they ran out of 100 yen pieces, which was the coin that was being used to play video games there. Right. I started looking at it. In the United States, uh, the Mint uh, produced 1 billion quarters in 1982. Right. Uh, by rough calculations, uh, in 1982, Ms. Pac-Man games took in 5 billion quarters, <laughs> which amazing. means they were going around and around and around. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Back, back at kind of like your uh, kind of like your days at MIT. They just kind of kept rolling those quarters back into those machines. Yes, they do. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, um, great story, and you know that's um, you, you have a, you even have a little um, little ghost behind you too. Or is that that's not a ghost? That's a uh, which which that's, one is? That? That's a little ghost or a monster. A ghost, yeah. Um, just neat, you know. And and I I, I think what you know what you said about the the way the game had was changed uh, is just fascinating because you know it really uh, I've watched some some shows about video games and uh, the one we talked about before about the Donkey Kong and about how getting to the end of Donkey Kong was sort of a a big uh, you know rite of passage sort of like really getting to the end of Ms. Pac Man is kind of a, a or is there really an end to Ms. Pac Man I don't remember well there was an end to Pac Man. Uh, not right. a very glorious one. When you got to a particular screen, uh, 255, I believe, it crashes. Okay. Uh, the screen <laughs> splits in half and whatever. Right. Um, and uh, we were criticized for not having fixed that bug, but we never thought anybody on Ms. Pac-Man would ever get that far. Right. And that's always the uh, uh, interesting last words of a video game designer saying, no one will ever get this far. Right. And they always do. And they always do. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, well, um, 
let's let's get into the geocaching because uh, you know you are uh, you are an avid geocacher, and I find that just equally fascinating. Uh, uh, so, how did you first learn about geocaching? Um, a friend of mine, uh, whose handle goes by Eagle Scout 1968. And by the way, I was also an Eagle Scout, so we uh, oh, had neat. something in common. Uh, he uh, uh, had become quite the geocacher, and we were on a nonprofit board together. Mm -hmm. And he kept bothering me to go out geocaching with him. And my comments always to him is, well, that sounds a little weird. Uh, you know, I don't have time for it. I, I don't want to, whatever. Um, and so for quite some time, I did not. And uh, my birthday rolled around, and he, as a birthday present, gave me a geocaching adventure and dinner. Oh, as great. The present. That's cool. Um, did turn out quite that well because the night we were, or the afternoon we were supposed to go geocaching was 34 degrees and freezing rain. Oh, my. And so he elected properly not <laughs> to take me out that day and have my first geocaching experience right. be totally miserable. Right. So we just did the dinner. He told okay. me all about geocaching. Mm -hmm. um, I went on to Amazon, ordered a Garmin. It arrived two days later on Amazon mm -hmm. Prime. I think right. they had that back then. Yeah. And uh, two days later uh, from there, uh, my wife and I were meeting friends in Aruba. Um, oh, so wow. I took it with me. And so yep. my first find was in Aruba. <laughs> it's in Aruba. <laughs> we have, that's appropriate, I tell you, Doug, because we're gonna, we'll talk about all the places you've geocached. So actually, it's kind of neat that your first one was in somewhere else. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I guess that kind of got you hooked, or did it? It did. Uh, okay. We came close to clearing out Aruba, and sometime mm -hmm. I have to go back and clear it out. Uh, one of my things I've tried doing is clearing countries, and yeah, Aruba is small enough it can be done. And you've, it, it, uh, we're going to mention in a minute uh, how many uh, you've, you've cleared out a few countries. Uh, that's, that's really awesome. I have. Um, that's cool. Um, so now, so, um, nowadays, you mostly geocache with a couple different people. Your wife does some. Yeah. Um, I, probably a good bit of my day to day geocaching is solo. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, it's kind of filling time where mm -hmm. I didn't figure out something else to do, so I'd run out and just grab something, or if I've got a half an hour between appointments or whatever, I'll grab a couple of caches in the area. Sure. Um, I do cache my wife. Uh, she hates urban caching. She right. thinks she's going to get arrested or something. <laughs> uh, so instead, uh, she does the hikes with me. She enjoys getting back in the woods and finding nice large containers with beautiful scenery and right. top of mountains and all that. Um, but she does not like going under park benches or anything else. Uh, sure. And then um, I got uh, a couple of friends that uh, I cash with, one uh, named Cute Little Fuzzy Monkey. Uh, he's a retired Navy uh, guy who now lives in Texas, so we right. don't get together quite as often anymore. And uh, a local kid, a 13-year-old named the Geo Spy. Oh, and, neat. Um, he has to rely on me a good bit because he has cleared out every cache that he can reach by bicycle. So <laughs> okay, that's good. We go out together. Good for him. And then lastly, we've got a couple of groups uh, that go on geocaching adventures. Uh, mm -hmm. The initial one, uh, we were not good at naming, so we became Team Omastech, which because we had people from Ohio, Massachusetts, and Texas. That's awesome. Uh, and Florida was not even in that because I was living in Massachusetts at the time. Right. Um, but that team um, did uh, the ET Highway together. Uh, and then a slightly different configuration of that team uh, did a lot of uh, Europe together, Eastern Europe, when we were uh, on a cruise over there. Oh, that's neat. Um, uh, in fact, that team was the one that uh, we did our infamous six countries in one day uh, trip with. Yes. Fascinating that you did this. Um, well, let's, let's talk about that. Um, so... Um, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna pull up your stats too, uh, just because it'll be easier. But uh, so talk talk about that day of of doing six countries in a in a day. Well, it it was uh, 
a challenge I, I was trying to figure out how to pull it off or to look at. We were in Budapest and were uh, with four of us who geocache, none of them all that seriously besides me. But mm. I started looking going, wow, the borders are not that far away, except for I don't know exactly what the borders are like. Right. So um, I uh, first started trying to map it with Google Map and saying, if we start in Budapest and uh, drive to Romania, how long will that take? Right. And then, okay, if we go from Romania to uh, Serbia, uh, how far is that? And then Bosnia. And so I started mapping it out and saying, well, yes, we could technically get six geocaches if we can cross the borders. Right. If to let you in and out of the countries. <laughs> and I did not really know how to kind of figure that out. So um, I contacted uh, a geocacher in Budapest who had a lot of hides. And he quickly got back to me and started giving me advice. And I, I think he turned out to be uh, one of the top police officials in Budapest. And I asked him what he would like to go with me. He said he couldn't get the time off. Uh, but he gave me a lot of advice about the border crossings. And so off we went. Uh, we left at 3.30 in the morning. Um, and ended up at uh, uh, Romania for sunrise. We were timing it perfectly. Right. Sun came up. We were right where our first cache was in Romania. Uh, we found it, did not have to use the backup one we had slated, and then headed off for the border between Romania and Serbia, um, which was a very slow, slow crossing. Uh, <laughs> it took about an hour and a half to cross. Um, it actually took more time to leave Romania than to right. get into Serbia. Um, wow. So those countries seem to care more about you leaving than entering. Um, yeah, I guess that kind of makes sense. But And then our schedule started looking like we were not going to make it. Uh, mm -hmm. Fortunately, the other border crossings were a little bit better. So we hit Serbia, Bosnia, Croatia, uh, Slovenia, and then got back to Hungary to get our last cash uh, at 1030 uh, that night. Wow. And our spouses uh, had seats at the local pub. Uh, ready for us with food ordered. Uh, the kitchen had closed, but they had already ordered food for us. So that's awesome. Got very well. Yeah, that is awesome. Uh, and that was in 2014. So, you know, you uh, you probably had. Uh, I don't know if this could have been done, like earlier on in the geocaching years, because you probably were able to, uh, you know, take advantage of some of the the newer technology and, uh, you know, just a uh, just fascinating how. Uh, geocaching sort of changed over the years, you know, and we're able to kind of utilize some other uh, tools uh, as part of this uh, process. So, yeah, you, uh, you try doing all the prep work you can do, um, yeah. and you, you're certain things are going to go wrong, and they do. Uh, right. We had a car GPS uh, all loaded uh, to get us around the highways, not knowing whether we would have cell coverage on our phones, right. and we did not, as it turned out. And as soon as we crossed into the Bosnia uh, uh, road system, mm -hmm. it went blank. Oh, no. Uh, there were no maps for Bosnia. Oh, wow. And so uh, we are just kind of feeling our way around, uh, knowing, all right, we're pretty close to the border here. Maybe we can get back. Uh, and we've got our handheld Garmin's saying the cache is three miles and uh, mm -hmm. 3.8 miles that way. And so we just right. started driving. <laughs> start, start really, really. Uh, utilizing the, the GPS at that point. Yeah. So, um, this is an interesting, uh, in, I think it's a, a, a so it really is, uh, um, amazing stat 74 countries. Did you ever think that you'd, you'd be geocaching in 74 different countries? Well, it's, it's fascinating. We, my wife and I do travel a lot, uh, right. but probably a third of those are just hopping over the border or uh, having our trip extend uh, through a country because uh, of the fun of it. Right. Um, so um, I was uh, on vacation in Italy, for example, and my son uh, was doing some work over in China. I said, well, maybe I should stop in and visit him. Right. And in order to get from Italy to China, I had to obviously drive through Liechtenstein. Right. Um, because I did not have that yet. Um, uh, went to Geneva to grab a flight. Right. Uh, or, or whatever it was. Switzerland. Right. I already had Switzerland. Oh, did you? Uh, okay. 
But in order to fly over to China or Hong Kong, as the case may be, you had to stop somewhere. So I started looking at routes and go, United Arab Republic, I will stop in Dubai. There you and go. Get a in Dubai. So that's how I picked up UAE as a country. Right. So there's hope, I guess, for some of us that are that look at this this stat of 74 and uh, and go. Um, and, and again, it's uh, we'll get into later about numbers and all that. But just just to kind of for fun, try to do as many countries. It may not be as difficult as we at first glance, I guess. Well, a little bit of it is looking and saying, can I connect through a country? Uh, my wife was the one that first suggested this. I was doing a little consulting work over in London, and she said, why don't we stop in Iceland on the way back? And I think she wanted to see Iceland, and sure. I wanted to see <laughs> uh, a geocache there, so it worked out wow. well. Um, Icelandic Air had a free 24-hour layover for the same price as uh, a through ticket, and so we spent 24 hours in Iceland. That's neat. Yeah. That's a, you know, just a, like you said, it's a great idea and it, it gets you to, 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 that's what geocaching, you know, as you've mentioned and we've all kind of know is that that's the beauty of geocaching. It gets you into places sometimes that you don't either think about going to or, you know, unexpectedly find yourself at and go, wow, you know, I never knew this was here. So, um, well, well for example, the, um, a, a friend of mine who does a little bit of geocaching was traveling over in France, and for some reason he crossed into the country of Andorra and found a cache there and then taunted me because I did not have a Andorran cache. That's awesome. So on the next trip to France, my wife and I drove over to Spain, stopped at Andorra, and got the oldest cache in Andorra. So uh, we, we now am familiar with the country of Andorra. There you go. Yeah, you get some somewhere you probably never have, have thought about going, but there you, you know, there you go. Um, yeah. So uh, you've done all fifty U.S. states. Um, how did that go overall? Do you think um, that that was somewhat similar? Um, where um, I was not doing any big trip of uh, running through all the states, but when I got an opportunity of waking up two hours early or three hours early and driving to the border of another state because I was in Denver or wherever I might be, I would do it. And so uh, it was often getting up at four in the morning uh, in my rental car uh, and being back in time for breakfast. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Uh, when Susan and I, we went to uh, Colorado one day was kind of a, we made a decision. We're going to run up to Wyoming. So we, Race up to Wyoming, got a webcam cache, and came back. So we got, you know, we were able to grab Wyoming. So um, I, got, I got Wyoming uh, from Denver. Did you? All right. So Early one morning. <laughs> right. We did the same thing. Uh, and um, this is neat. Also, um, and this ties into um, somebody I'm going to have on the show in a couple of weeks, and that is I'm going to have on a, a German geocacher. But you have done all 16 of the German states. So you've uh, you've haven't obviously you're never going to clear out germany but you did get every state in germany that's that's a neat thing to do because there's there are big geocachers there yeah um now this is just uh one of our most recent trips uh we were in france and germany and i told my wife i would be staying on for an additional two days to hit each of the german states because i looked and said i could do a 16-hour loop of germany and hit each one um, so I could do that in two days and fly out of uh, Frankfurt. And then she got jealous and says, oh, I want to come along. <laughs> so we made it into four days. Um, and then after getting to northern Germany, Bremen, uh, we flew to Copenhagen, mm -hmm. uh, had some fabulous meals in Copenhagen. They have three of the top uh, restaurants in the world there now. Um, and then found the oldest uh, Denmark cache raced across the bridge, grabbed a Swedish cash, and then flew back to the States. That's awesome. And, and uh, it's good you mentioned that they have good food there because uh, you told us uh, on the other show about your meal. And it was in Iceland, wasn't it? You had the, the crazy yes. meal. <laughs> um, my, my wife and I are insistent on eating local food, drinking right. local wine, drinking mm -hmm. local beer. And uh, our experience in Iceland uh, was we went to a very old traditional uh, restaurant uh, which served old traditional food. 
And the uh, waitress came to us and said, what do you like? And we said, the most oldest traditional stuff you have. And so she brought us three dishes. Uh, the first was roasted puffin, uh, which are those cute little birds uh, that you wouldn't think about eating. But uh, we thought they taste kind of like duck, uh, not quite as good, but they're pretty close. Second course was minky whale. Uh, it, it, minky is not endangered. Right. Um, and it tasted like somewhat uh, uh, tuna sashimi. Uh, okay. So not too again, bad. Not quite as good. Uh, but yeah. Close. And then the third dish was uh, shark. And the way it was explained to us, shark cured in urine. And um, we mm. took a couple bites of it. We did not want to ask the question, whose? So right. we just ate it, uh, put up with it. It had a very pungent smell, oh. um, worse than any Limburger cheese you might have had. So wow. we wash it down with some beer. And I was like, get another beer and move on. <laughs> but we had local uh, Icelandic food. Did. Well, yeah, it's. I agree with you. When uh, it's not that maybe that that part, but we try to do uh, like Susan and I. We go somewhere. We like to to you know try to. Do a little local, try to eat the local e eats and uh, avoid the chains when we when we can. So, um, all right. Ne next kind of interesting note we have here, and I, li I like this, is that um, it's it's not the uh, the middle. It's not the um, it's not like the uh, astronaut who did the International Space Station in the uh, uh, bottom of the ocean, but these are pretty far away from each other. So. Tell us a little bit about your highest find geocache find and your lowest geocache find. Well, I have three very high finds. Um, the highest of which is Mount Kilimanjaro, which I climbed with my oldest son. Uh, the next highest is Mount Fuji, uh, which I climbed with my youngest son and my wife. Um, and then I have a couple in Colorado that are uh, also above 10,000 feet. Right. So. That's so that, uh -huh. so there you, so I want to yeah, mention to Jesse, yeah. So I want to mention to Jesse, uh, Memphis Mafia is in our chat room. So so there you go, Jesse. Uh, Kilimanjaro on Mount Fuji, and that's that's up your that's right up your alley because he lives in De he lives in Colorado. He lives in Loveland, Colorado. He's done a lot of the fourteeners, but uh, anyway. So and uh, then I, then to add to that, I have uh, one of the lowest caches you get with submersibles or anything. Uh, which is minus 1,362 feet, which is at the uh, shore of the Dead Sea uh, right. in Israel. Which is amazing. So you really, you are spanning, you know, that, I didn't realize it was that far below. I knew it was below sea level, but I didn't realize it was that far below sea level. So that's amazing, you know. The yeah, I, I had not either. Uh, we we uh, went to the Sea of Galilee, and uh, all of those caches were five or 600 feet. Uh, below right. sea level. And then when we got to the Dead Sea, uh, there were over a thousand feet. I go, oh, this is really cool. <laughs> awesome. Um, so, so nowadays, um, do you geocache, because you still geocache a lot. I mean, you, you've, uh, you know, you, um, your your find counts uh, are uh, are really amazing. Um, just like uh, last month, you found three thousand over three thousand caches in November. Yeah, uh, tw twice in my geocaching career, um, I've been part of large teams that go out to the Nevada area to do mm -hmm. uh, power trails for PT. four or five days, and this was part of Team Spam, which we formed uh, with. Some from Texas, some from Florida, some from uh, Massachusetts, and some from uh, California. Uh, spam stood for seven people and a monkey because you <laughs> cute little fuzzy monkey. That's awesome. Um, and so uh, interesting. So, and we talked about, and we, you and I have talked about before too about, and you put a little note in the the show notes about, you know, it's not about the numbers. I, I think that. Um, you and I both would agree that the numbers are fun. Um, but I think that, I think that, and this is something you probably, I'd like you to kind of comment on. And that is um, like when they did the, um, Oh, was it two or three years? It was, 
gosh, at least three or four years ago now, the um, every day in August souvenir thing. I think for some people, um, and also just like streaks, geocaching streaks, um, it's a thing that you can do if you want to do them, or I, I guess it's, it's kind of the attitude that you take into it, I guess is my, what I'm trying to get at is that, um, do you feel like caching either in, in that manner, either in streaks or in just to try to uh, get a certain amount, a certain number of, in a certain period of time, do you still look at that as a fun thing to do or um, how do you approach doing some of those items? Well, my longest streak is only 38. Right. It happened with the 31 days of August. And then I went seven more days and said, enough is enough. Right. Uh, because I would have a day or two that I had other things to do and it was no longer fun for me. Right. Um, but the guy I just mentioned, cute little fuzzy monkey, um, he uh, has a streak of over a thousand. Uh, mm -hmm. He, uh, and he's only been caching three years. He's had one day since he started caching without a cache. Um, I find him a little obsessive, driven by it, and say, are you still having fun? And he says he right. is. So. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, but uh, I think what is uh, so important is each person finding their own way of doing it uh, and what may be uh, fun challenges in terms of what they want to get out of the caching. Um, and the reason I put it's not about the numbers uh, is I have to keep on reminding myself that okay, just getting three more caches today doesn't really make any difference. Uh, right. you know, so what if I add them to my total? Um, but if I find a fun one, or if I really enjoy the hike, or if it's a year 2000 cache, or it's something uh, you know, different, uh, it's well worth doing. Right. And so for example, uh, we talked about Germany before. Mm -hmm. uh, Germany has, uh, I think all 10 of the top favorite caches in the world. Right. Um, and on our trip, I was able to get to three of those. I want to go back and get the other top favorite caches. Right. Uh, because they're favorited for a good reason. And so that's one of the things I view as a lot of fun. Um, so now when I hit a new area uh, for geocaching, I will do my queries where I'm not just looking and saying, where is the densest area I could grab the most caches? But I say, all right, where are the ones that have the most favorite points? Right. Uh, are there some uh, year 2000 geocaches I could get to? Um, there was a challenge cache once that uh, said you had to get a certain number of welcome to caches. Uh, wow. that, uh, uh, a lot of towns have signs and people put welcome to caches on those signs and there's a challenge. So now whenever I see a welcome to sign, I wonder if there's a geocache behind it. Right. And so it, it it gives a different way to look at it. So you're not just saying, well, let me add a five more caches today uh, into my total, uh, but looking for different ways to challenge myself. Awesome. Yeah, which leads really well, a good, good lead in there, Doug, to challenge caches. So um, I'm going to, we're going to, if we can, let's talk about, let me get the right screen up before we get started. So um, I find the, the, your challenge caches. Oh, by the way, I told Susan, uh, uh, the other day we were getting ready for things. I said, "Hey, we qualify for one of those challenges because uh, we found a cache high enough up." So I said, "Next time we're in Florida, we gotta go pick up that cache." So she's like, uh, "Explain to me one more time about challenge caches." So <laughs> I explained to her about, you know, we're qualified. We can do this cache. So um, you have some different different series, and so um, let me pull that screen up and let's take a look at these because I, I find them interesting. Um, so. Let me, uh, all right, let me make sure I change my screen too, because that always, okay. Are you, uh, are you seeing that okay, Doug? Your yes. screen? Okay, great. Hey, there you are. Um, so let's talk a little bit about these different geocaching series. Not all of them are, are well, let me ask you that. Is, are these all challenge caches or, or th these aren't all challenges? These are more of a series, right? Co correct. Each of these are a series of caches I put out and uh, maintain. Um, many of the uh, trails have been or areas have been around for four or five years. Uh, uh, and the caches, uh, once I put them into the series, I view have to stay uh, 
operational because I have a leaderboard on each of them. Yeah. And so, for example, the top one you're seeing is a uh, classic video game series, which are caches in the uh, uh, Boston area uh, off of classic video games from the 80s. And um, the, there is a table on the series cache or, uh, website that lists the first to find, how many finds on each one. And then if you scroll down a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, it generates a leaderboard of showing who has found them all or has found most of them. And it is amazing when you put out a leaderboard uh, how crazy people will become <laughs> trying to find uh, the newest one and get back to 100% on the list. Yeah, this is cool because this is actually um, unique, or I think it's fairly unique because it really isn't, it's not a what we would consider a traditional challenge cache, but well, it isn't really a challenge cache. It's a, no, it's this a is not challenge. It's a, like, right. It's like a geo trail. And your a geo series in this case is a good a good way to put it. Right. Yeah. And so th that one is in Boston. If you go back, um, yeah. there's a separate one for Boston, which mm -hmm. is entitled uh, Great Chefs of Boston. And these are all tributes to uh, some of the uh, better chefs in the Boston area and are often hidden near their restaurants. Oh, cool, um, yeah. Now, I, I am a... partly in the restaurant business as a hobby, and mm -hmm. so uh, some of these people I know pretty well and decided to put out a cash as a tribute to them. Oh, awesome, yeah, there's some great names. I'm kind of uh, uh, up on some of the culinary. Ming Tsai, that's, uh, he's, he was a iron chef uh, right there. Yeah. And of course, everybody's heard of Julia Child. And so, so that's cool. So um, you've got... Um, the Julia Child one is particularly fun because it is right outside the house she used to cook in. Uh, oh, and cool. so you get to go by and actually see the house. And there's a plaque to the house and everything. So it brings you to an area of Cambridge that no one gets to uh, other than come yeah. to see Julia Child's house. You know, that's... And that's what geocaching can take you to, is places you would never... Uh, we've been to Boston a few times and... Uh, uh, definitely will have to do some of these because um, you know you want, you like to get off the you like to get off the uh, the tourist uh, trail sometimes and and see something different so that's really cool. Um, and then now you've got um, another one for the, for set. This is in Florida. Right. So this is here in Florida, and we have uh, thirty eight different ones uh, now in video games down here, and almost all of them are themed containers or are puzzles that are themed off that particular video game. Oh, right. Um, so you got it. Yeah. So for example, the Ms. Pac-Man one, uh, you get a maze and you have to find your way through the maze. And as you uh, find the solution for the maze, you end up crossing uh, the coordinates. Oh, and, very cool. Uh, it's not an easy maze to solve. <laughs> oh, excellent. I like that. That's a great idea. Puzzle caches, man. That's awesome. Uh, so, Fascinating. Then you've got obviously some people who are, are, uh, there are not, I a believe two of them at thirty eight right now. 100%. Yeah, two, two of them have done it, and a lot of people close. A lot of you know, good good, good amount of people that are close to finishing. Yeah, well, I'm uh, kind of cruel. Every time uh, someone gets a hundred percent, I'll put out a new one. <laughs> Doug, <laughs> I tell you, no, that's all right. That's cool. Uh, and then this so, is the one that I was looking at. Um, this is an interesting power trail. Uh, this is one of them. One of the caches on this trail is what I was, I guess, what I was referring to earlier, in that it's a challenge. It is a challenge cache. Um, right. So what what you have there, if you stay on the upper map, yeah, um, we have a forty five mile section of Route four forty one in Florida uh, that we have put out caches along uh, right. over over three hundred caches. Uh, it starts off with uh, something I'm very embarrassed about, uh, New York Yankees <laughs> logo in Geo. Oh, goodness, but, yes. I've uh, seen it that. ends with the Boston Red Sox uh, Geo Yay. art at the bottom. So both logos are there uh, fighting it out as always. Right. <laughs> uh, below that's a cartoon series, uh, just a power trail of traditionals, uh, then a section of letter boxes, uh, 20 or 25 letter boxes. Um, and then at the very bottom, uh, right before the geo art, uh, is the tribute trail. But in between uh, is uh, kind of our pride and joy, which is the retired monkey challenge trail. And that challenge trail consists of a uh, little over 150 challenges. Uh, we're still adding a few to it as we go, okay. uh, which um, 
uh, reflect both mine and uh, cute little fuzzy monkeys uh, caching styles. Right. Uh, with the requirement, which we always followed, that one of us has to have met the challenge. Um, I can meet uh, some by my travels. He can meet others by the fact that he has cached a thousand consecutive days and has already sure. gotten 21,000 caches. So he has lots wow. of density and things like that. Right. right. Um, um, so different styles. And uh, so we've had a lot of fun creating very, very challenging uh, caches uh, in very, very different ways. And then with the help of a friend up in Boston, Sloth96, mm -hmm. um, we created a, uh, a checker uh, for every single one of the caches and then a verification page. So okay. if you subscribe to uh, Project GC yep. and go to the verification page, it will automatically tell you which of the 150 uh, challenge caches you already qualify for. Right. Uh, by checking your stats against the uh, challenges. And uh, how, um, cause we, we had talked briefly about challenges and then there was the moratorium. And then I think we talked was actually in the middle of the moratorium. Um, do you feel like that um, the, the process of, or how do you feel about it now that we've got Project GC, which we both love, uh, how do you feel about Project GC as far as the 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 point of uh, having it as the checker, and how do you feel about the how the process has gotten to at this point? Well, I I, I think it's good and bad. Uh, okay. I think it was necessary uh, for uh, Groundspeak to put the moratorium on and figure things out because it was getting. Uh, quite wild in terms of what people were putting in for uh, challenges, uh, what was allowed, what was disallowed, inconsistencies between regions, if you had a tough reviewer versus an easy reviewer. And then on the other side of it, the reviewers were spending huge amounts of time trying to figure out whether they were fair challenges, whether they made sense, and whether they were uh, you know, uh, fair and checkable. Uh, right. So th there was a need to do things. Um, and I really do love having checkers on uh, all of them, if possible. Uh, right. But in some cases, the checkers are almost impossible to write or impossible to write, and hence some of the creative ideas may not be there uh, okay. in, in the future. Um, right. And uh, so a lot of the challenges are going to start looking very much the same. Uh, mm. Florida will have the same challenges as Texas, which will have the same challenges as California, because we'll all look at Project GC and say, oh, there's a checker for that. I will do that. Right. Um, so um, it, it, while well, I talk, if you can go to the verification page. Um, sure. Um, but so if, uh, uh, go to the challenge trail again. Um, oh, we're here? The, um, the challenge trail here? I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah. Go back to the go back here. No, no, no. Go go forward. No. Go forward. Okay. Sorry, everyone that's watching this. It's okay. Scroll down. Okay, okay. It's okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Down to the challenge section. Right, right. here. Click on that and then okay. at the very top uh, is verification page. Oh, very, I got you. Yeah, verification page. All right, cool. Ah, right. okay. So, great. so yeah. this is uh, running a check on Oh, okay, uh, every great. single uh, one of the challenges that are part of the trail. Okay. Um, and with Project GC, it's also rating the difficulty based on their database of all the cachers. Uh, oh, so okay. uh, a skull and crossbone 18 is a pretty easy one. You scroll down, you'll start seeing some 98s and 99s, and uh, things sure. get much, much more difficult oh, wow. uh, as you get down to the bottom of the list. Yeah. So you can check. Okay. So, okay. There's a 92. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so if I were to go to this one, um, and I'll kind of Kate, I don't want to do all that stuff right now, but um, so it will. Um, I'm logged in as me. We'll give it a second. Interesting. So for me, I can go, I could go look at these lists and I can say, you know, that's one that, um, that I might be able to, to, to do just because 
Um, we can go back. Um, so that that skull and crossbones is uh, something I could look at and tell this skull and crossbones, and it, it, it will tell me sort of a difficulty level. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Correct. That, that's uh, Project GC running the challenge against their database. Oh, okay. Uh, and seeing uh, what percent of people qualify for it. Okay. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, wow. These are these are cool. This is. Um, and so, if you if you were mm -hmm. if, if you were logged in, it would be putting uh, s smiles next to it if you qualified and uh, yeah uh, X's if you do not. Right. Oh, very cool. Yeah, I will. I will do that. I'm not uh, I logged in at the moment. That's okay. Um, fascinating. So, do you think that that maybe over time they may have to do a little bit of a tweak, or or maybe there'll be enough of a of a uh, groundswell maybe that would cause uh, there to be more discussion as far as changing some of these items? Do you think maybe or? Yeah, I, I think over time, uh, ways will be figured out uh, to uh, either figure out a checker or to come up with a class that doesn't require checking or something. Okay. Uh, but I think just recognition of the fact that uh, the challenges are fun to a, a certain class of cashers uh, as ways to keep challenging themselves to do different things. <coughs> right, right. Um, I think that the... Um the, the, like you said, I think that the uh, the process had to have, had to go somewhere, and so I think that um, you know the this may be a step, and maybe in the future, you know, this sort of be expanded upon. But um, anyway, neat, neat. Um, all right, let me uh, let me close the. All right, let me stop sharing. All right. Very cool. Um, so, wh where or what are you? What is your plan? Or, or, or let me ask a couple things. One is, how do you plan uh, for caching nowadays? And do you have anything in the works? And then we're going to talk about. Uh, your geomobile here in a second. So, do you do you still kind of plan, or how how do you, how are you doing that of late? What what is your way of doing it? Um, I I think there are certain categories of caches I want to find. Uh, as I said before, I will go for any high favorited cache. Mm -hmm. uh, if that's traveling in Germany, it's three thousand or above, or five thousand and above in favorite right. points. So I'm traveling locally, it may be 30 or above, but uh, it says something is special about that cache, I should go see it. Uh, right. It may be a container I want to uh, copy uh, and bring oh. down to Florida or Massachusetts. It right. may be just for the enjoyment of it uh, or the, ch the challenge of it. So mm -hmm. um, I, will, I will almost always, when I go into an area, scan for favorite points. Yeah. Um, I also look for the very old ones. So oh. pretty much if there's a year 2000 within any reasonable range, I'll go for that. Sure. Um, and I, I think I'm up to 25 of the year 2000 caches, and I want to just right. keep on going on those uh, just for the historic value of them in my mind. Right. And the fact that those will dis those are slowly disappearing, you know, and uh, even though you've you finished Jasmer, you know, the old ones. It it's nice to find those because, like you said, they're they are disappearing. There's some very, some some great history there that's um, you know is go is kind of going away in a sense. So, and so when I'm now going back to states after having a, the state already found, obviously, uh, I look and say, okay, can I get to the oldest one in that state? And so I'm slowly collecting the, those. I'm up to um, 15 states where I've gotten the oldest cash. But I've gotten the oldest cache in 17 countries, which is kind of fun, and the oldest cache on two continents. Uh, and yet, I don't have Mingo yet. So uh, that would be three, <laughs> hey, three continents, I got 18 one on countries, you. <laughs> and 16 states. That's awesome. Well, I, I got one on you, Doug. I got Mingo. So, yes. <laughs> I have twice had trips planned that I had to cancel to go get Mingo. So, oh, well. sometime. Sometime. 
it's neat. You know, it's one of those you put on the list, you know. So, all right, let's let's talk a few minutes about, uh, and I'm going to screen share again. I forgot we're going to, we want, we got to talk, we, we talked a little bit before the show, but um, we're going to talk a little bit, Doug, about the, uh, uh, this vehicle. <laughs> Uh, actually, let me, sh let me show your cash mobile first and I'm going to show it up close. Is that okay? I can do this. Yeah. Okay. I figured you're good with it. So what, what he is showing is my current cash mobile, which is a Tesla X. It is a seven adult passenger SUV, uh, that does zero to 60 in 3.2 seconds and, uh, can go off road. I've had it out mudding before. It can mm. take a bike rack on the back uh, where we put our uh, mountain bikes, um, and yet uh, it uses no gasoline. It plugs in, it's electric as Teslas are. And most excitingly is it is slowly uh, being uh, becoming more and more automatic. Uh, it has autopilot as one of its features. And uh, in my first year of owning it, I probably put on 75% of my miles uh, while in autopilot mode, meaning I don't touch the steering wheel, brakes, uh, or accelerator. Which is fascinating. Uh, we're going to show this, uh, uh, for, uh, show this, uh, Doug, and talk a little bit about, um, this, uh, this video they put together and just tell us a little bit about how, um, let me turn the sound down. Yeah, I kill the sound because it'll, it'll overwhelm our discussion. There we go. Um, sure. What, what you're watching is on the left-hand side is the uh, uh, view over the driver's shoulder of what it looks like riding in the Tesla where it is steering itself. Uh, now, this, this one has more features turned on than mine. Uh, mine right now is not reacting to stop lights or stop signs, but it does react to all the cars the, uh, the lines uh, on the road and everything. So uh, as long as you don't have a red light, there's no, that there's no car in front of you, uh, you can just leave it on autopilot and let it just go. Uh, Amazing. I noticed in the video at one point, it, it kind of paused right there. It paused because it saw the ladies on the side jogging. Does it pick up people pretty well on the sides of roads, do you think? or It, it does. Uh, the, the first couple of times uh, I went past people in a bike lane on our road, I would always grab the wheel, worry that it might not see the bike. It sees right. it much better than I do. Okay, uh, that's awesome. But, but it's still um, a supervisory autopilot. Uh, right. It still has the expectation and requires you to show that you touch the steering wheel every now and then, that you're not uh, dozing off or watching the movie <laughs> or anything. Right. Um, but, um, it, it is uh, fascinating that it is getting very, very good very quickly uh, as all the cameras and sensors are, are paying attention to the environment around you. Yeah, I mean, it figured out, like, you need to get in the left lane to turn, and, and you, you know, it, 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 it's interesting how it, it, um, it, it picked up on little things that I, I didn't know it, it could, you know, it, I, I, I don't know, I was, I was fascinated by the fact that it was able to, to figure out some of those items and it's interesting it shows on the right hand side or you know uh for the video it's showing you know how it's figuring out where people are where the where, you know lines where it needs to figure out because you know there's not every road has the greatest you know uh striping on it so correct you know on, on a perfect road it's very easy for it to do its job but uh it's got a complicated problem in front of it and it's got a few years to get it perfect, but uh, mm -hmm. it's headed that way. And I think what I told you earlier, the exciting news is our kids will never have to take away our car keys. We'll That's just right. Our car and it will drive ourselves. That's uh, right. And it's coming faster than most people think. And uh, yes, it really is. And there's a, I'll show that for the last minute. I'll, I love your little, your, uh, your uh, travel bug on your car yeah. that travel bug was made uh by a friend of mine ms monkey uh who makes custom uh decals so yes. that if you already have a travel bug number and whatever she can incorporate that and she did this one for me with the colors of uh ms pac-man uh and my uh car's travel bug uh, so uh, that 
uh, resides in the back. Yes, and um, Ms. Monkey um, is Ms. Monkey uh, dot com. Uh, and so here's her website and you can go get things customized there. Yes. Awesome. There's a little shop. Good items for Christmas, all the Christmas you're, you're kind of running out of time, but you know, just for any kind of, uh, any kind of time you want to, you know, get one of these, uh, decals, uh, for a friend or for yourself. It's a great idea for a gift, you know, um, you had another one that was another interesting, um, this was another suggestion we were talking about Christmas um, is, and I've, I've, I saw the guy and I didn't get a chance to talk to him um, recently was at um, when we were, I was in um, Denver, Colorado at the Geo Woodstock and uh, uh, he was there and discussing a little bit about his geocaching maps. And um, that's a neat idea. Really is yeah, for, uh, uh, for a gift. Mm -hmm. Rumor has it. I'm getting one for Christmas. Uh, oh, cool. Christmas, uh, but it is fascinating that it can uh, show quite graphically all your different accomplishments by showing the states you've gotten to, the countries you've gotten to. Uh, it shows uh, where your concentration of finds are, uh, your uh, furthest distances. Uh, you can get most of the stats on there. Um, it, it, it's a lot of handwork for him right now, so uh, you would get one in time for Christmas if you uh, contacted him right now. But if you're trying to give it as a gift to someone, you can give him a certificate probably and say, mm -hmm. you'll get one eventually. Um, right. But really cool maps. Yeah. It's, a, it's such a, it's a, it's a neat idea. And uh, we were talking the other day about, um, you know, uh, uh, gifts during a, the show. Uh, we did a show about geocaching gifts and uh, you know, this is uh, I'm glad you mentioned those two. They'll be in the show notes. Uh, Show notes will be up. If not tonight, they'll probably be up uh, uh, early tomorrow. So, um, well, an hour, an, an hour goes fast, Doug. We're, we're running out of time, but we're going to do a giveaway. A um, couple things I want to do as far as the giveaway, and then we'll kind of uh, wrap up the show for tonight. Um, I did a random.org on – I did a uh, – during the week, uh, Doug, I did a um, – talking about the show and, and showing, let me show the coin that we're giving away right here. There's the coin. It's a cool coin. And, uh, we're going to be, we're giving away, uh, let me show the back of it too. If I can show that. All right. I love the back of the coin too. It's awesome. Here we go. Um, so we're giving away one, uh, there we go. Um, so, um, giving away one live on the show here in a moment, and I'm giving away one. Um, give, giving away one that we did from Twitter. I had people uh, retweet about the show, and um, everybody that retweeted, I put into uh, a list, and then I did I used random.org and punched the number uh, as uh, got that idea. Uh, from Joshua Johnson, the geocaching vlogger, which is little things back here. And uh, we did that at Geo Woodstock and uh, worked out good for his wooden nickel thing. So I use it periodically for giveaways. And I did it a little bit before the show and it came up with uh, his Twitter handle is Forest Fire One. So at Forest Fire One, I need you to, uh, I'll send you a message, but I need to get your email address. And I will be sending you one of these coins uh, in the future, uh, shortly. And we're going to give one away uh, right now. So I'm going to pull up the uh, chat room. So everybody get ready with your answers to a question I haven't asked you yet. <laughs> get your fingers ready. Get your chat room ready to go. And um, Doug, I'm going to let you pick uh, one of the questions, one of the Questions that you and I put together. So pick one of those if you would. I'm going to watch the chat room and see who answers the question. The first person to answer it uh, will get uh, one of these geocoins as well. So, Doug, give us a question. Okay, question one. In Pac-Man, the four monsters were named Inky, Blinky, Pinky, and Clyde. In Ms. Pac-Man, the last monster was changed its name to be named after my sister. What is the hey, fourth monster's name? That's cool. I'd forgotten that little little part to that. So, 
Um, we're, we're waiting. While we're waiting um, for an answer from our folks as they, they Google around. Oh, we got an answer already. I was going to, I was going to vamp for a while, but uh, Deborah Burris, doc firewoman answered correctly. And that was Sue. Sue is my sister. And I got to name a monster after her. That's awesome. You get to name a monster after her. that's neat. Uh, so other people are like, no idea. That's okay. Uh, so you gotta be, you gotta be quick. You gotta be fast. Yeah. IB geocaching got Sue a little slow. Deborah got it. Sorry. Um, but Deborah got it. So, yep. Uh, Sue is the correct answer. Deborah, you have won uh, a shiny coin. We come to you soon. So she's like very excited. Uh, Deborah lives in, in Arkansas and, uh, is, uh, um, been on the show before. She's, uh, we're gonna try to have, to have her on again. Uh, she is a, uh, a teacher, a professor, uh, in, uh, central Arkansas university. So, all right. Um, no, I, sorry. Uh, Peter, you were not first. Sorry, buddy. Um, you were not first. So, all right. Good times tonight. I really appreciate Doug, you, uh, getting all this information together and, and, uh, for being on the show, uh, I've really uh, always enjoy always enjoy hearing about uh, your your experiences. It's just a, a neat neat th neat uh, neat stories uh, and a neat experience. Uh, so, uh, well, coming soon, and you'll like this one too, Doug. Coming soon uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm having on a fellow by the name of Thomas Hendel. He is a German geocacher. He lives just outside of Munich. So we're going to talk uh, best we can. I think his English is pretty good, but he's going to be on the show, um, not live. I'm going to do that show taped. It's seven hours different. And so uh, I'm going to tape that. That's for uh, New, Year's, New Year's night. Uh, so I'm going to tape that show ahead of time. But next week, Christmas night, I'm actually going to do a live show. It's going to be – I didn't want to cause anybody to – I didn't want to ask anybody to do a Christmas night show. So I'm doing my first show by myself, Doug, of the 28 shows I've done. Uh, I've always had a guest on. So this is the time I'm not going to have a guest. But I still want people to show up because it's going to be great. Uh, we're going to talk about the kind of year in review and look ahead to 2017 and talk about uh, some things to look forward to for next year uh, in the geocaching world. Uh, in three weeks, I'm having uh, Dan Buck, uh, Geocaching with Derek, will be on the show on January 8th. And then January 15th, uh, Nick Hubbard will be on the show talking Cashly 2.0, 2.01 we're up to now, and then 2.02 .02 is coming out soon. And I keep bugging Nick because I got some things I, I want to see uh, hopefully in uh, a version. And uh, he uh, he's saying it might be 2.02. .02, .02, but uh, anyway, I'm very thankful for Cashly and Nick uh, in his uh, uh, app. So... Anyway, enough of that. Well, again, Doug, thank you again for being on the show and that it all worked out for right before Christmas uh, and um, just uh, a chance to get together. You're welcome. Definitely enjoyable. As yes. Always. Thank you. I always have a good time talking about these things. So I uh, hope everybody enjoyed the show and we hope you, um, you know, uh, Share it with friends. Tell people about, uh, you know, if they missed the show. I know some people weren't able to see it. Uh, but, you know, watch the show on either YouTube or you can catch it on uh, iTunes, uh, Stitcher, Google Play if you want to listen to the show. Uh, it'll always be up on YouTube as well, as well as the uh, website. Uh, well, please email me your comments at geocachetalk at gmail.com. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at geocachetalk, Facebook at facebook.com slash geocache talk. And, uh, you know, until, until next week, uh, you know, don't just talk about geocaching. Uh, do what Doug does and what I do when I can as well, and that is go geocaching. To so, the four corners of the world. That's right. Get out there and go, go travel and go geocaching as you go. So, all right. Good night, everybody. Good night.